Hey guys, and welcome back to another chapter of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Today we're reading chapter two, The Vanishing Glass. Nearly 10 years had passed since the Dursleys had woken up to find their nephew on the front steps, but Privet Drive had hardly changed at all. The sun rose in the same tidy front gardens and lit up the brass number four on the Dursleys' front door. It crept into their living room, which was almost exactly the same as it had been on the night when Mr. Dursley had been fate, had, had that fateful news report about owls. Only the photographs on the mantelpiece really showed any time had passed. Ten years ago, there had been a lot of pictures of what looked like a large pink beach ball wearing different colored bonnets. But Dudley Dursley was no longer a baby, and now the photographs showed a large blonde boy riding his first bike, on a carousel at the fair, playing a computer game with his father, being hugged and kissed by his mother. The room held no sign at all that another boy lived in the house too. Yet Harry Potter was still there, asleep at the moment, but not for long. His Aunt Petunia was awake and it was her shrill voice that made the first noise of the day. Up, get up, now. Harry woke with a start. His aunt rapped on the door again. Up, she screeched. Harry heard her walking towards the kitchen and then the sound of the frying pan being put on the stove. He rolled onto his back and tried to remember the dream he had been having. It had been a good one. There had been a flying motorcycle in it. He had a funny feeling that he had had the same dream before. His aunt was back outside the door. Are you up yet? She demanded. Nearly, said Harry. Well, get to move on. I want you to look after the bacon and I don't want you to let it burn. I want everything perfect on Duddy's birthday. Harry groaned. What did you say? His aunt snapped through the door. Nothing, nothing. Dudley's birthday. How could he have forgotten? Harry got slowly out of bed and started looking for socks. He found a pair under his bed and after pulling a spider off of one of them, put them on. Harry was used to spiders because the cupboard under the stairs was full of them and that was where he slept. When he was dressed, he went down to the hall into the kitchen. The table was almost hidden beneath all of Dudley's birthday presents. It looked as though Dudley had gotten the new computer he had wanted, not to mention the second television and the racing bike. Exactly why Dudley wanted a racing bike was a mystery to Harry, as Dudley was very fat and hated exercise, unless of course it involved punching somebody. Dudley's favorite punching bag was Harry, but he couldn't often catch him. Harry didn't look it, but he was very fast. Perhaps it had something to do with living in a dark cupboard, but Harry had always been small and skinny for his age. He looked even smaller and skinnier than he really was because all he had were old clothes of Dudley's, and Dudley was about four times bigger than he was. Harry had a thin face, knobby knees, black hair, and bright green eyes. He wore round glasses held together with a lot of scotch tape because of all the times that Dudley had punched him on the nose. The only thing Harry liked about his own appearance was a very thin scar on his forehead that was shaped like a lightning bolt. He had had it as long as he could remember. And the first question he could ever remember asking his Aunt Petunia was how he had gotten it. In the car crash, when your parents died, she said, and don't ask a questions. Don't ask questions. That was the first rule for a quiet life with the Dursleys. Uncle Vernon entered the kitchen as Harry turned over the bacon. Comb your hair, he barked, by the way of a morning green. About once a week, Uncle Vernon looked over the top of his newspaper and shouted that Harry needed a haircut. Harry must have had more haircuts than the rest of the boys in his class put together, but it made no difference. His hair simply grew that way all over the place. Harry was frying eggs by the time Dudley arrived in the kitchen with his mother. Dudley looked a lot like Uncle Vernon. He had a large pink face, not much neck, small watery blue eyes, and thick blonde hair that laid smoothly on his thick fat head. Aunt Petunia often said that Dudley looked like a baby angel. Harry often said that Dudley looked like a pig in a wig. Harry put the plate of bacon and eggs on the table, which was difficult as there wasn't much room. Dudley, meanwhile, was counting his presents. His face fell. 36, he said, looking up at his mother and father. That's two less than last year. 
Darling, you haven't counted Aunt Marge's present, see? Here, it's under this big one from Mummy and Daddy. All right, 37 then, said Dudley, going red in the face. Harry, who could see a huge Dudley tantrum coming on, began wolfing down his bacon as fast as possible in case Dudley turned the table over. Aunt Petunia obviously sensed danger too, because she quickly said, and we'll buy you two and another two presents while we're out today. How's that, Popkins? Two more presents, is that all right? Dudley thought for a moment. It looked like hard work. Finally, he said, so I'll have 30, 30, 39 sweetums, said Aunt Petunia. Oh, Dudley sat down heavily and grabbed the nearest parcel. All right then. Uncle Vernon chuckled. Little tyke wants his money's worth, just like his father. boy, Dudley. He ruffled Dudley's hair. At that moment, the telephone rang and Aunt Petunia went to answer it while Harry and Uncle Vernon watched Dudley unwrap the racing bike, a video camera, a remote-controlled airplane, 16 new computer games, and a VCR. He was ripping the paper off of a gold wristwatch when Aunt Petunia came back from the telephone looking both angry and worried. Bad news, Vernon, she said. Miss Figs broke her leg and she can't take him. She jerked her head in Harry's direction. Harry's mouth, Dudley's mouth fell open in horror, but Harry's heart gave a leap. Every year on Dudley's birthday, his parents took him and a friend out for the day to adventure parks, hamburger restaurants, or the movies. Every year, Harry was left behind with Mrs. Fig, an old mad woman who lived two streets away. Harry hated it there. The house smelled of cabbage and Mrs. Fig made him look at photographs of all the cats she had ever owned. Now what, said Aunt Petunia looking furiously at Harry as though he planned this. Harry knew he ought to feel sorry that Mrs. Fig had broken her leg, but it wasn't easy when he reminded himself that it would be a whole year before he had to look at Tibbles, Snowy, Mr. Pauls, or Tuffet again. We could phone Marge, Uncle Vernon suggested. Don't be silly, Vernon. She hates the boy. The Dursleys often spoke about Harry like this, as though he wasn't there, or rather as though he was something very nasty that couldn't understand them, like a slug. What about, what's her name? Your friend, um, Yvonne. On vacation, Aunt, snapped Aunt Petunia. You could just leave me here, Harry said, and hopefully. He'd, been able, he'd be able to watch what he wanted on television for a change and maybe even go on Dudley's computer. Aunt Petunia looked as though she had just swallowed a lemon and come back and find the house in ruins, she snarled. I won't blow up the house, said Harry, but they weren't listening again. I suppose we could take him to the zoo, said Aunt Petunia slowly, and leave him in the car. That car's new. He's not sitting in it alone. Dudley began to cry loudly. In fact, he wasn't really crying. It had been years since he had really cried but he knew that if he screwed up his face and wailed, his mother would give him anything he wanted. Diddy Dums, don't cry. Mommy won't let him spoil your special day, she cried, flinging her arms around him. I don't want him to come, Dudley yelled between huge pretend sobs. He always spoils everything. He shot Harry a nasty grin to the gape in his mother's arm. Just then the doorbell rang. Oh, good Lord, they're here, said Aunt Petunia frantically. And a moment later, Dudley's best friend, Piers Polkis, walked in with his mother. Piers was a scrawny boy with a face like a rat. He was usually the one who held people's arms behind their backs while Dudley hit them. Dudley stopped pretend crying immediately. Half an hour later, Harry, who couldn't believe his luck, was sitting in the back of the Dursley's car with Piers and Dudley on the way to the zoo for the first time in his life. His aunt and uncle hadn't been able to think of anyone else or anything else to do with him. But before they left, Uncle Vernon had taken Harry aside. I'm warning you, he said, putting his large purple face close to Harry's. I'm warning you now, boy. Any funny business, anything at all, and you'll be in that cupboard from now until Christmas. I'm not going to do anything, said Harry, honestly. But Uncle Vernon didn't believe him. No one ever did. The problem was, strange things often happened around Harry, and it was just 
No good telling the Dursleys he didn't make them happen. Once, Aunt Petunia, tired of Harry coming back from the barber's, looking as though he hadn't been at all, had taken a pair of kitchen scissors and cut his hair so short he was almost bald, except for his bangs, which she left to hide that horrible skull. Dudley had laughed himself silly at Harry, who spent a sleepless night imagining school the next day, where he was already laughed at for his baggy clothes and taped glasses. The next morning, however, he had gotten up to find his hair exactly as, as it had been before Aunt Petunia had sheared it off. He had been given a week in his cupboard for this, even though he had tried to explain that he couldn't explain how it had grown back so quickly. Another time, Aunt Petunia had been trying to force him into a revolting old sweater of Dudley's, orange, brown with orange puffballs. The harder she tried to pull it over his head, the smaller it seemed to become until finally it might have fit a ham puppet, but certainly would not fit Harry. Aunt Petunia had decided it must have shrunk in the wash, and to his great relief, Harry wasn't punished. On the other hand, he'd gotten into terrible trouble for being found on the roof of the school kitchens. Dudley's gang had been chasing him, as usual, when as much to Harry's surprise as anyone else, there he was sitting on the chimney. The Dursleys had received a very angry letter from Harry's headmistress telling them Harry had been climbing school buildings. But all he tried to do as he shouted Uncle Vernon through the lock of his door was jump behind the big trash cans outside the kitchen doors. Harry supposed that the wind must have caught him in midair. But today, nothing was going to go wrong. It was even, it was even worth being with Dudley and Pierre to spend the day somewhere that wasn't school, his cupboard, or Mrs. Figg's cabbage-smelling living room. While he drove, Uncle Vernon complained to Aunt Petunia. He liked to complain about things. People at work, Harry, the council, Harry, the bank, and Harry were just a few of his favorite subjects. This morning, it was motorcycles. Roaring along like maniac little young hoodlums, he said as the motorcycle took over them. I had a dream about a motorcycle, Harry remembered suddenly. It was flying. Uncle Vernon nearly crashed into the car in front. He turned the right around in his seat and yelled at Harry, his face with like a gigantic beat with a mustache. Motorcycles don't fly. Dudley and Piers snickered. I know they don't, said Harry. It was only a dream, but he wished he hadn't said anything. If there was one thing the Dursleys hated even more than his asking questions, it was his talking about anything acting in a way that it shouldn't, no matter if it was in a dream or even a cartoon. They seemed to think he might get dangerous ideas. It was a very sunny Saturday and the zoo was crowded with families. The Dursleys bought Dudley and Pierre's large chocolate ice creams at the entrance, and then because the smiling lady in the van had asked Harry what he wanted before they could hurry him away, they brought, bought him a cheap lemon ice pop. It wasn't bad either. Harry thought, licking it as though they were watching, licking it as they watched a gorilla scratch its head, who looked remarkably like Dudley, except that it wasn't blonde. Harry had the best morning he had had in a very long time. He was careful to walk a little ways apart from du the Dursley so that Dudley and Piers, who were starting to get bored with the animals by lunchtime, wouldn't fall back on their favorite hobby of hitting him. They ate in the, rest the zoo restaurant, and when Dudley had a tantrum because his knickerbocker glory didn't have enough ice cream on top, Uncle Vernon bought him another one and Harry was allowed to finish the first. Harry felt afterwards that he should have known it was all too good to last. After lunch, they had went to the reptile house. It was cool and dark in there with lit windows all along the walls. Behind the glass, all sorts of lizards and snakes were crawling and slithering over bits of wood and stone. Dudley and Piers wanted to see huge poisonous cobras and thick man crushing pythons. Dudley quickly found the largest snake in the place. It could have wrapped its body twice around Uncle Vernon's car and crashed, crushed it into a trash can but at the moment it didn't look in the mood. In fact, it was fast asleep. Dudley stood with his nose pressed against the glass, staring at the glistening brown coils. Make it move, he whined as his at his father. 
Uncle Vernon tapped on the glass, but the snake didn't budge. Do it again, Dudley ordered. Uncle Vernon wrapped the glass smartly with his knuckles, but the snake just snoozed on. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. He wouldn't have been surprised if it had died of boredom itself. No company except stupid people drumming their fingers on the glass, trying to disturb it all day long. It was worse than having a cupboard as a bedroom, where the only visitor was Aunt Petunia hammering on the door to wake you up. At least he got to visit the rest of the house. The snake suddenly opened its beady eyes, slowly, very slowly. It raised its head until its eyes were on a level with Harry's. It winked. Harry stared. Then he looked quickly around to see if anyone was watching. They weren't. He looked back at the snake and winked too. The snake jerked its head toward Uncle Vernon and Dudley and then raised its eyes to the ceiling. It gave Harry a look that said quite plainly, I get it all the time. I know, Harry murmured through the glass, though he wasn't sure the snake could hear him. It must be really annoying. The snake nodded vigorously. Where do you come from anyway? Harry asked. The snake jabbed its tail at the little sign next to the glass and Harry peered at it. Boa constrictor, Brazil. Was it nice there? The boa constrictor jabbed its tail at the sign again and Harry read on. This specimen was bred in the Sioux. Oh, I see. So you've never been to Brazil. As the snake shook its head, a deafening shout behind Harry made both of them jump. Dudley, Mr. Dudley, come and look at the snake. You won't believe what it's doing. Dudley came waddling towards him as fast as he could. Out of the way, you, he said, punching Harry in the ribs. Caught by surprise, Harry fell hard on the concrete floor. What came next happened so fast, no one saw how it happened. One second, Piers and Dudley were leaning right up close to the glass. The next, they had leapt back with howls of horror. Harry sat up and gasped. The glass front of the boa constrictor's tank had vanished. The great snake was uncoiling itself rapidly, slithering out onto the floor. People throughout the reptile house were screaming and starting to run for the exits. As the snake slid past swiftly, Harry could have sworn a low hissing voice said, Brazil, here I come. Thanks, amigo. The keeper of the reptile house was in shock. But the glass, he kept saying, where did the glass go? The zoo director himself made Aunt Petunia a cup of strong sweet tea while he apologized over and over and over again. Piers and Dudley could only gibber. As far as Harry had seen, the snake hadn't done anything except snap playfully at their heels as it passed. But by the time they were all back in Uncle Vernon's car, Dudley was telling them how it had nearly bitten his leg off, while Piers was swearing it had tried to squeeze him to death. But worst of all, for Harry at least, was Piers calming down long enough to say Harry was talking to it. Weren't you, Harry? Uncle Vernon waited until until Piers was safely out of the house before starting on Harry. He was so angry he could hardly speak. He managed to say, go, cupboard, stay, no meals, before he collapsed into a chair and Aunt Petunia had to run and get him a large brandy. Harry lay in his dark cupboard much later, witching he had a watch. He didn't know what time it was and he couldn't be sure the Dursleys were asleep yet. Until they were, he couldn't risk sneaking into the kitchen for some food. He lived with the Dursleys almost 10 years, 10 miserable years, as long as he could remember, ever since he had been a baby and his parents had died in that car crash. He couldn't remember being in the car when his parents had died. Sometimes when he strained his memory during long hours in his cupboard, he came up with a strange vision, a blinding flash of green light and a burning pain on his forehead. Then he supposed, this he supposed was the crash, though he couldn't imagine where all the green light was coming from. He couldn't remember his parents at all. His aunt and uncle never spoke about them, and of course he was forbidden to ask questions. There was no photographs of them in the house. When he had been younger, Harry had dreamed and dreamed some unknown relation coming to take him away, but it had never happened. The Dursleys were his only family. Yet sometimes he thought, or maybe hoped, that strangers in the street seemed to know him. Very strange strangers they were too. A tiny man in a violet top hat had bowed at him once while out shopping with Aunt Petunia and Dudley. 
After asking Harry furiously if he knew the man, Aunt Petunia had rushed them out of the shop without buying anything. A wild-looking old woman dressed in all green had waved merrily at him once on a bus. A bald man in a very long purple coat had once shaken his hand in the street the other day and then walked away without saying a word. The weirdest thing about all these people was the way that they seemed to vanish the second Harry tried to get a closer look. At school, Harry had no one. Everybody knew that Dudley's gang hated that odd Harry Potter in his baggy old clothes and broken glasses, and nobody liked to disagree with Dudley's gang. Be sure to stop back on Monday for Chapter 3 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. See ya!